Warning, I'm not a lawyer. I'm reading something from 2021, May 24th. It's the final re-re-re-revision by the ATF as a public posted proposal, waiting for people's commentary and, more importantly, lawsuits and complaints. Uh, one of them will be linked below uh, as a response to it, basically a snide remark response, and it's on Club Front Net, Firearms Policy Coalition's attachment, frames and receivers. But I'm going to cover what I find to be much more interesting. It should be noted that, again, emphasis added, the National Firearms Act, 1930s, was to outlaw handguns, when that was found to be literally an unworkable or impossible thing to do, even though that legitimately, even in today's date, handguns are responsible for the majority of mass shootings and illegal actions taken by people using firearms. Regulating that away by getting rid of the handguns was the original intent. I'm not kidding, that's really it. And if you don't like that answer, I don't care. Um, in fact, that's what it was. And then they found out that it was not workable for them to decide to take away handguns because handguns are concealable weapons, they're easy to hide, and they're also one of the more ineffective weapons at long range and for shooting large numbers of people on a practical level. But if you're not being practical, if you're just shooting random people, yeah. But they made a bunch of rules to outlaw making a handgun from anything else. And those rules were left in place even though their only purpose was to keep you from ever getting a hold of a handgun, and they're being used as a blunt instrument to regulate people when it was excluded for them to do so. Again, the original rules were excluding the government from regulating things unless needed. Regulating whether or not I have a flare gun that's made entirely out of metal so that it lasts longer or doesn't break or isn't dangerous to me is a dumb thing to prevent me from having. And I can have one as long as it's a larger bore and more dangerous. These unintended consequences are because of the steadfast stubbornness of these rules. Let's go on with the proposal. Privately made firearm. This is the first time I've ever seen anybody try to make a definition for what we in the United States can do. We have the right to make, keep, and bear arms in this country as long as we're not doing it as a profession. If we're doing it as a profession, once we get beyond a certain point, it behooves us to be considered a gunsmith or whatever, and we have to get we have to pay a tax to do it because we're doing it to make a living. If, however, we're doing it as a project, an experiment, academic purposes, or just fucking around on YouTube, okay. But if you make money at it, that's a profession, and at that point, you are at the point where you need to start paying taxes on it. I understand that. Privately made firearm is a firearm or a frame or receiver assembled or otherwise produced by an individual person, a maker, not a manufacturer. They didn't include that in the definition when they're required to, because the word maker and manufacturer have been legally constricted when it comes to firearms, and the ATF avoided using that wording, which it means they're trying to get away with something. But let's move on. Anyone other than a licensed manufacturer that makes a firearm. That is the definition, essentially, but again, they're leaving out certain words. But at least they use the word manufacturer. Without a serial number and or other identifying markings placed by a licensed manufacturer at the time it was produced. So it's not a licensed manufacturer who is required to put serial numbers on. Thank you for acknowledging we don't have to do that. This does not include NFA registered firearms or one made before 1968 a certain date or manufactured after that date or anything that's a National Firearms Act regulated weapon. If a person makes one of these, they have to do all the serial numbers and stuff, in effect, becoming a manufacturer for a short period of time. A good example of this is that I'm allowed to build a 12-gauge shotgun that's pistol grip only, whatever. I can't make a short barrel. I can pay a $200 tax stamp and have the ATF give me a number to put on it and instructions on how to label it, and if I pass the background check for 200 bucks, I'm allowed to chop it off and make it my flare gun that's a 12-gauge if I want. Yes, it's a $200 flare gun. Um, but at that point, I can break action, put a longer barrel on it, use it for any other firearm I want. In fact, I can specifically say, I want you to make it legal for me to put a buttstock on it and a short barrel rifle, you know, like a, a pistol with a buttstock on it. It makes it where I have a legally unlimited usage for it. If I need to do that for ammunition testing, the way you get around that is you make a 26-inch long lower made out of wood or whatever, and you can put a short barrel on it as long as it's pistol grip only. They legally allow you to do that. It's a test gun. It can also work as a real gun, but the point is it's for testing ammunition, feet per second, 
you know, that kind of stuff. It's a way of not legally having to do the two hundred dollar tax stamp. But if I'm, but if I'm testing ammunition, I really do want that two hundred dollar tax stamp piece of equipment because that means they come in and inspect. I've given away my rights to restrict them. I don't have a presumption of privacy, but I'm playing nice with them, and they don't legally have a good reason to throw me in a jail cell. And then the ATF does it anyway when they feel like being a jerk, or because they had a tip. Or they just felt like it. Abuse of power. So yeah, I'm going to avoid that by making sure I make it completely street legal, but I'm not going to tell them I own it. So let's talk about their re- their restrictions on this. Under the proposed rule, dealers and gunsmiths could mark a firearm that was made by an ordinary person, privately made firearm, and they may be licensed just to do that as a business, a new licensing category for stamping these homemade guns. Why? Yes, that's boss music you're hearing. Dealers and gunsmiths are not authorized to perform, repair, modify, embellish, or refurbish, or install parts in or on firearms, frames, receivers, or otherwise for or on behalf of licensed importer or licensed manufacturer. Those firearms are for sale and distribution and have a Type 7 manufacturer license requirement. So these would be restricted to just domestic only and Pretty much a niche, a niche business of authenticating a gun and saying, okay, yeah, it's, it's stamped. This is a little bit familiar if you're from Britain or dealt with California at one time letting you do this and then deciding, okay, now that we know about you letting us mark your guns, now you have to turn them over because they did a gun grab. People just sold the guns out of the state so that it wouldn't have that restriction and they would get their value out of it and said, yeah, I sold it so you can't take it from me with no money. Marking requirements for firearms other than person, uh, per, uh, again, what was it again? Uh, privately made firearms under the proposal rule. Licensed manufacturers and importers must identify each part defined as a frame or receiver determined by the ATF, manufactured import, blah, blah, blah. This is import rules. And it, it tells you how to do it. Uh, a uh, abbreviated federal firearms license number, prefix, hyphen, and then number followed by it as a suffix. So it'd be number dash number for import. Okay, that's nice. That's not really relevant for our personal made firearms. Each part defined as a frame or receiver, machine gun, firearm muffler, or firearm silencer that is not a component part of the completed device, shipped or otherwise. Again, we're doing this again. Uh, modify, uh, excuse me, naming it. Unless you know the caliber or whatever for the gun, like a universal receiver like I want to do, um, you don't have to put the caliber gauge on it. You can just put the word multi or not, or just leave it blank until it's confirmed. A licensee must mark completed weapons or frames or receivers disposed of separately, as the case may be, no later than seven days following the date of completion of the active manufacturing process or prior to disposition, whichever is sooner. So it sets time limits. Okay. Marking and record keeping requirements for personally made firearms. Licensees must properly mark each homemade gun acquired before the effective date of the rule within 60 days after the rule becomes final on or, or before the date of disposition, including the personal collection, whichever is sooner. So what this is a rule is, is that if you have a homemade gun that doesn't have serial numbers on it, even though the homemade gun is not required to have serial numbers on it. The people who are doing the marking, for some reason, are required to do it within a particular time period. Properly marked, previously acquired, personally made firearms themselves or may arrange to have another licensee mark the firearm on their behalf. But again, these aren't required to have uh, markings. They are currently in inventory. The licensee choose not to mark, may be destroyed or voluntarily turned over to law enforcement. Once the rule becomes final, and unless other uh, already marked by a licensee, properly marked each homemade gun within seven days following the date of receipt of the other acquisition. Mark them acquired after a rule becomes effective themselves or under their director's supervision, blah, 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 blah. You have to, it's about marking them over and over again. And it has to be your FFL ID code and a, um, a random string of numbers afterwards. Record them in their acquisition disposition record, whether or not kept overnight. Licensee may refuse to accept 
your homemade firearm or arrange for private individuals to have them marked by another licensee before accepting them, providing they are properly marked in accordance with this proposed rule. Why is there a proposed rule to mark something that doesn't legally have a rule that says you have to mark them? Okay, let's retread this. This is my misinterpretation of things. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an idiot. Do not follow my instructions. Under the proposed rule, this sets up a groundwork for dealers that have federal firearms licensing or licensing specifically just to validate homemade firearms as a prefacing of making a rule that says anybody who has homemade firearms must now mark them. If you're not aware of what happened in California, California made a rule against homemade firearms unless they were of specific variety and had certain safety features. And of course, all those evil criminals registered their firearms and followed the rules and made California compliant firearms. I mean, not kidding. And then at one point, the legal system in California then decided, now that we have a records database of all of this, we're going to declare the firearms illegal and make you turn them over anyway. They charged a fee for this and wouldn't refund it at first. Now, I'm going to explain this only in the paranoid sense, I, as I've just done. Now, let's go on to the next part. But if you're wondering, is this going to fly? Again, this was in May of 2021 this was brought up. What's a firearms parts kit? Proposed rules explains that a partially completed frame or receiver parts kit reaching the stage in the manufacturing, or they didn't say making, making is different, where it may readily be completed, assembled, restored to a functional state, or converted, it is claimed to be a frame or receiver because we say so. I'm not oversimplifying it. The problem is they were starting off with people who had literally just a metal paperweight, not a functioning gun. And it would require significant alteration by the user, not something minimal. You could buy a jig someone made and get most of it done, and it'd probably work more often than not, literally 51% of the time, right from the get-go. That was good enough. But the ATF standard was to have an actual expert in gun making complete the receiver, could have done it blindfolded most likely, and claim, oh, 100% of it is completed directly. No, no barrier for entry, no learning curve. And remember, it says if it can convert or restore to functional state. And it has to say the word readily somewhere in here. It may readily be completed, how readily? Your gun expert? By the way, uh, someone got arrested for having lower receivers for AR-15s that were milled badly, meaning they couldn't be converted no matter what because they were the wrong dimensions. You couldn't mill it to make it work better. You had to add metal in certain parts. It would never work. Still arrested because intent or some other excuse. Eventually, the ATF had to legally be compelled by a judge to admit they were never lower receivers because they were non-functional. They also tried to go after somebody who made scale models of AR-15 lowers that were also incomplete. They could work for 22 caliber rimfire, which if you're not aware of it, no, they wouldn't have worked either. Because, again, the dimensions weren't perfect. I mean, it's a really, really fine grain requirement. And the fact that it requires an upper receiver that doesn't exist to make them work, it's like, yeah, I made a puckle gun scale model. There aren't any spare parts for puckle guns. You can't finish it. But hey, it's an unfinished receiver, so we can sue you. Weapon parts kits, partially completed frames or receivers, can, can, that can are firearms for which they each frame or receiver of the weapon could be need to be marked, etc., etc., etc. Someone's opinion on this: Cong the ATF had to admit that Congress did not want all the parts in a gun to be declared a firearm. They decided that was too much; it would require too much work. Every piece has to be serialized. They didn't want to be like Britain at one time, which had the same requirements. Also, this is getting around the rule that says in the United States, if you make your own firearm, you are not legally required to do a damn thing with it other than just don't break the law. It's a presumption of innocence on your part. It is not common behavior for people to make firearms from 3D printers to go shoot up a, a school or a bank. They normally just get a gun that's perfectly street legal and just misuse it. The same as a person with a baseball bat would do. Don't need to sit there and make the baseball bat. You can go buy one. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Good luck with that.
This is my horrible misinterpretation video.